This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Merry Christmas, everyone. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and we have a very interesting Christmas episode for you. George Salamis, President and CEO of Integra Resources, and I dare say George presents us with a pretty simple and easy solution to the Canadian economy's problems. It's a plan that can be gotten started on pretty soon. We'll probably have real results in five years and in 10 years could position Canada into a a very strong position. Really, I think, like punching at and above its weight class. I mean, Canada, you know, sometimes it's referred to as a middle power And sometimes you get the impression, frankly, that it punches below its weight class on the global stage. And when you look at Canada's resources, its natural resources, and sheer scale of its landmass, the riches of that landmass, the security, being neighbors with the U.S. and on great terms with the U.S., They know what's good for us is good for them, and Canada knows that what's good for the U.S. is good for Canada. When you put that all together, Canada should be a major power in certain respects from a purely resource in the ground perspective. And George Salamis brings up some what I'd call salient points on how we can actually act on this, and starting with just first principles philosophically, how we need a bit of a paradigm shift if we are going to go in this direction. So I think perfect end of year Christmas episode with George Salamis, president and CEO of Integra Resources. And he mentioned Bitcoin, not me. Don't worry, we don't talk about it too much, but it is there at the end of the interview. So for all you enthusiasts, a little Christmas gift at the end of our conversation. Yes, so that is coming up. Also coming up next month is AMEBC's virtual conference, January 18th to 21st. And you can find them on their social media. Just do a search on AMEBC and Twitter. And for those of you who are looking for last minute Christmas gifts, it is not too late to go to northernminer.com slash subscribe where you can get a nice subscription to the Northern Miner newspaper or digital edition and website. So if you're looking, you're scrambling, you're running all over the place, shops are closed, you don't know what to do. It's a very nice gift for that investor and miner in your life. You know, that investor who's trying to get rich quick on those little juniors. Well, here's your newspaper for you. And there you have it. So... With that, let's get right to the news. Some very interesting stories. A lot of more CEOs. We got shareholders, angry, all the good stuff. So let's get right to that. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn and also on YouTube where we also host these podcasts. And wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts, And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, Rio Tinto has announced a new CEO, and his name is Jacob Stausholm, and he will become CEO in January 2021 of the world's, is it the world's biggest mining company? or I think it's the world's biggest, it's either them or BHP. And here is the story by Cecilia Jamazmi, mining.com. Rio Tinto is named finance head I want to say Jacob, Jacob Stausholm, as its next chief executive, replacing incumbent Jean-Sébastien Jacques, who had to step down following an international outcry, primarily from this podcast, over the miners' destruction of sacred Aboriginal rock shelters. Just joking there, but we did have an outcry of sorts. Stausholm, a Danish national who joined the company in 2018 from shipping company AP Muller Meersk, will be tasked with rebuilding this world's second largest miner's reputation. There you have it. Rio Tinto number two. 
Rio Tinto fell out of favor with the general public, including investors, following its decision to blast two 46,000-year-old Aboriginal rock shelters at Chukin Gorge to expand an iron mine in Western Australia. So we know all this. More on the actual promotion. Stoussholm's promotion came as a surprise to some Australian investors who have argued that a new CEO should have local experience and be based in the country that provides 85% of Rio's profits. And we had Edward Sturck, a metals and mining analyst at BMO Capital Markets, weigh in, and he approved, quote, We think Mr. Stoussholm is an excellent, cool-headed, and sensible appointment, albeit unexpected, as most observers were expecting an Australian appointee. He continues, We do not expect an immediate change in Rio Tinto's corporate strategy, but we do anticipate a transformation in corporate culture over time. Let's see. RBC's Tyler Broda also said the appointment was a, quote, clear positive, end quote, but noted that Rio Tinto could face criticism from some investors who see the change as insubstantial relative to the magnitude of the Juke and Gorge incident. Weighing in myself, I say, let's give him time. Uh, let's see how he does. And let's give him a chance. Continuing on, Stoussholm, who said restoring trust with indigenous groups and other stakeholders was a, quote, key priority for the company, end quote, he will have to face a complex situation at Rio Tinto's biggest growth project in Mongolia. The vast Oyutolgoi copper gold mine has been plagued by delays and cost blowouts that have triggered disputes with the country's government and Rio Tinto's partner on the project, Turquoise Hill Resources. Also, shareholders are annoyed, to put it mildly. So... Big tasks ahead for Rio Tinto's new CEO, Jacob Stoussholm. So best of luck to him. Continuing in the controversial direction, Northern Dynasty to challenge rejection on Pebble next month. So the Pebble Project, again, Dynasty is the word here, the ongoing soap opera. They should just call themselves Dynasty Minerals, not Northern Dynasty Minerals. But Northern Dynasty will work. This by Mining.com staff, Northern Dynasty Minerals will in January submit its request for an appeal of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' negative record of decision for its Alaska's Pebble Copper Gold Molybdenum Silver project. The company said it would argue that the USACE's mitigation requirements for Pebble were contrary to policy and precedent in Alaska and that the agency's rejection of the mining firm's compensation mitigation plan was procedurally and substantively invalid. Ron Thiessen, Northern Dynasty's president and CEO, said in a statement, quote, Although we believe the USACE's significant degradation finding to be contrary to law and unsupported by the administrative record is established by the Environmental Impact Statement, we set out in good faith to meet their demand for in-kind and in-watershed mitigation at a very high and unprecedented ratio for Alaska, and after a tremendous amount of professional effort and investment, we did it. Continuing for the USACE, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, to summarily reject a CMP really getting in the weeds here that is directly responsive to its requirements to do it on the basis of what we believe to be largely minor and arbitrary deficiencies and without giving the proponent an opportunity to respond to those alleged deficiencies or otherwise amend its application is, we believe, without precedent in the long history of responsible resource development in Alaska. Well, there you have it. Uh, you can read the whole thing if you want to read more. Ron Thiessen's, we have more of the statement, the latest episode from Northern Dynasty. And for those who are new to this story, the problem is, is the mine would be near the world's largest commercial sockeye salmon producing region. So this has been hampered in controversy for near two decades. We have stories going back to 2005 on the northernminer.com website. So I try not to read this with too much sarcasm. Just indulge me a little bit as I read another Northern Dynasty story. And this is quite interesting. So Saul Gold has this unbelievable project in Ecuador. 
and copper's hot, BHP is involved in as a shareholder, I believe, if memory serves. Now, Nick Mather, the CEO, who is former Mining Person of the Year for the Northern Miner, only two years ago in 2018, he is facing shareholder anger at the AGM. So let's take a closer look at this controversy here. There have been delays this year and Mather's decision in May to raise money through a $150 million royalty and streaming agreement with Franco Nevada elicited criticism from some of the company's shareholders. I think totally understandably. If you, like, can they not get a loan on their $150 million? If they have this good of a project, they're just going to sign away their, their, in a stream? Uh, like, how many percent? Like, what, one, two, three percent? I, I don't blame the shareholders at all. We're just going to sign that you can't get the money another way. You can issue shares however you need to do it. But these NSRs, the displeasure was voiced at Saul Gold's annual general meeting on December 17th when 44.75%, in other words, 45% of the company's shareholders voted against Mather's reappointment to the board of directors. Think about that. Mather, who according to the company's most recent corporate presentation, owns a little over 4% of sold gold, and he could not be reached for comment, even though he won the Northern Miner Person of the Year. Digging a little deeper here, we have Cornerstone Chairman Greg Chimandy who issued a press release, quote, as one of the largest shareholders of Solgold, it is obvious to Cornerstone that the current Solgold board is incapable of managing the affairs of Solgold for the benefit of all shareholders in a prudent and transparent manner. Additionally, it is our view that the proposed Franco-Nevada royalty financing will significantly destroy shareholder value for all Solgold shareholders. Calls for the board's replacement came shortly after Cornerstone rejected Solgold's second hostile takeover bid. Solgold launched its first disclosed all-share bid for Cornerstone in March 2019 and second on June 30th, 2020. The second bid valued Cornerstone at about $140 million. Canadian. So how much does Cornerstone own? They own 7.54% of Solgold and has a 15% interest in ENSA the Ecuadorian company that holds 100% of the Cascabel concession. Sol Gold owns the remaining 85%. So Cornerstone is a significant shareholder here. Okay, and here's the details on the NSR. Under Sol Gold's financing package with Franco Nevada, revealed on May 11th, the first $100 million in funding gives Franco Nevada a perpetual 1% net smelter return royalty. The agreement can be upsized by $50 million to a 1.5% NSR within eight months of the agreement. In addition, Saul Gold and Franco Nevada signed a $15 million secured bridge loan at a 12% interest rate for a four-month period with an option to extend the maturity for another four months. Yeah, I mean, you just wonder. I think just most shareholders would just wonder, like, could you not find a better deal? With all the money that's being lent out, could you not get a better deal than this? Oh, here we go. Ingo Hoffmeyer, Saul Gold's executive general manager of corporate finance, said in a press release announcing the royalty deal that the company had, quote, received and considered a broad range of funding options, and the decision to proceed with Franco Nevada is based on various factors, including the size of the investment, the permanent nature of this financing, Franco Nevada's experience and understanding of Latin America, and the competitive cost of capital. Hoffmeyer also noted that in Saul Gold's opinion, a 1% to 1.5% NSR, quote, will not constrain the debt capacity of the project. On the contrary, we believe this financing increases the confidence in Saul Gold's ability to fund the development, further affirming the overall quality of the Alpala deposit. And so this is what they're going to use it for. Saul Gold said the funds would be used to complete a feasibility study and any surplus would be used for Saul Gold's share of the development of Alpala, pursuant to agreements with Cornerstone Capital. And here's another quote from a mining analyst who requested anonymity, quote, the big companies don't like royalties because they take value away at a project level. But Saul Gold's argument is they're trying to maximize Saul Gold's shareholder value, and it's very dilutive to give equity. The royalty deal preserves the equity component for equity holders, and they haven't realized the full value yet for the project. 
And Franco Nevada are going to be partners, and that's not necessarily a bad outcome. I've never a huge fan of royalties, but sometimes you don't have a choice, he continued. Cascabel is a huge project, and if their equity price has been higher or someone would offer them a higher price, they would have taken it. I mean, did they just act too quickly? They did this in May. I mean, look at where copper's gone. Can we still call this a good decision? With the way copper's going, could they not get better loans than 12% and a 1.5% NSR? Like, you know, I'm not like an expert on these things, but it doesn't look too good to me. Now, I don't know, is there anything else on this? And then we have another quote from the analyst. As for the AGM quote, it was really just Nick the vote was against, and there weren't enough votes to get him out. Nick's a successful and self-assured guy and has some great successes, and some people don't like him for that. Well, you know, I think I actually have met Nick, and it's nothing personal. It's just when you look at these decisions, I'm not a shareholder. I don't own any mining stocks, by the way. You do just question these kind of decisions. But, you know, who knows? But a lot of shareholders are not too happy with Saul Gold CEO and President Nick Mather, former person of the year at the Northern Miner. Continuing on, now here's a CEO that people love, Ross Beatty, who's a big proponent for climate change, I might add. Uh, he was at the Northern Miners Canadian Mining Symposium a year or two ago, and uh, about a year and a half ago, and he really made a plea. Anyways, now he's, I believe, chairman of Equinox Gold, and they're seem to be, they just keep popping up. They just bought Premier Gold in a $480 million all-stock deal. This is by Cecilia Jamasmi, Mining.com. Equinox Gold is buying fellow miner Premier Gold Mines, which will spin out its Nevada assets in a new U.S. gold miner to be called I-80 Gold Corp. The all-stock deal hands Equinox Gold Premier's interest in the Hard Rock Project in Ontario, the Mercedes Mine in Mexico, and the Hisaga and Rahil Bonanza properties in Red Lake, Ontario. Premier South Arturo and McCoy Cove properties will be held by I-80 Gold, which will also complete Premier's previously announced acquisition of the Getchell Project all in Nevada. Now, South Arturo, I believe, is a joint venture with Barrick in Nevada, so they separated that out. Equinox said that it would undertake a $75 million equity financing, fully underwritten by its chairman, Ross Beatty, to help fund the deal. Maybe Saul Gold should have just talked to Ross Beatty because he just spent $75 million in equity underwriting the deal. That's almost, he could have gotten a 1.5 or a 1% NSR that could be turned into a 1.5% NSR with Saul Gold if he just doubled his contribution there. But continuing on, finally, uh, Premier Investors will own 16% of Equinox Gold once the deal is complete, as well as 70% shares of I-80 Gold. The spinoff company will be led by Premier's current CEO, Ewan Downey. Equinox Gold will own the remaining 30% of I-80 Gold. So, pretty interesting. Ross Beatty, one of the sharpest guys in the business, Uh, And you see, like, I mean, I don't think any shareholders are complaining about Ross Speedy to help fund the deal. Like, that starts to look a bit more promising. But these things are all open for debate. And finally, probably my favorite nerdy project is Arania Resources. They are in Ecuador, and they're looking for ancient mine sites from, well, ancients, uh, Depends who you ask what that means, but these ones are about 500 years old, maybe even 400. So ancient might be a bit of an overstatement, but they are gathering evidence of a mine corridor at Lost Cities Katuku Project. And they're saying they found more evidence of ancient roads this is by mining.com staff and peculiar landforms that may be old prospecting or mine sites near its Lost Cities Katuku Project in southeastern Ecuador. The Canadian miner found the roads in the vicinity of the Tyria Shimpia silver zinc lead target area, which is developing into one of the larger mineralized areas so far identified in the exploration project. According to Orania, for their investigation of the jungle covered road reported to be visible in LIDAR imagery in May supports the concept that it is indeed an engineered structure. Keith Barron, Orania's chairman and CEO, I need to get Keith Barron on this program 
said that he and his team may have been intrigued for a while by the accumulation of evidence that Tiria Shimpia may have been investigated for silver by the colonial Spanish. Quote, Although historic references to mining at the center of Logroño de los Caballeros and Sevilla de Oro do not reference silver production, the colonial Spanish were already familiar with silver lead zinc mining at sites like Zacatecas in Mexico some 20 years before Logroño and Sevilla were founded in Ecuador. The Council of Indies in Spain mandated that all occurrences of minerals be examined thoroughly for the crown by pitting and tunneling, not just those that were gold-bearing. If such workings can be located, they potentially provide evidence of Spanish activity. So now, Keith Barron also said that fieldwork by a registered archaeologist is required to confirm that the structures are man-made. Subsequent to the archaeologists' investigations, the feature may require further study by the National Institute of Cultural Heritage of Ecuador. You know, I'd say that's almost a bit of a risk for the project. If all of a sudden, they, how does that work if they find, you know, archaeological artifacts? Their, like, how do they develop that? So, interesting dilemma, but I guess first you find the treasure, then you decide what to do with it. And there you have it. So, now let's turn to metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on December 22nd, gold is trading at $1,874.12. That is $32 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $25.98 per ounce. That is is a dollar seventy six higher than last week's quote. Platinum is trading a dollar lower at one thousand and fourteen dollars and sixty one cents. Palladium is trading at two thousand three hundred and nineteen dollars and eighty cents per ounce. That is four dollars lower than last week's quote. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is ten cents higher at three dollars and sixty one cents. Per pound, aluminum is a penny higher at 93 cents per pound. Lead is also at 93 cents per pound, unchanged from last week. Nickel continues to climb at $7.96 per pound. That is 16 cents higher than last week's quote. Tin also continues to climb at $9.19 per pound. That is 34 cents higher than last week's quote. Cobalt is 20 cents higher at $14.52 per pound. And zinc also climbs 2 cents higher at $1.29 per pound. So what do we see? Basically, precious metals more or less stable. Small bounce in gold and silver. But the real standouts are copper, which continues its run. Nickel, which continues its run and zinc. Copper, nickel, and zinc. They are leading the charge on the industrial base metal bull market that seems to be forming. And with that, those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have George Salamis, president and CEO of Integra Resources. And Mr. Salamis has, has 30 years of experience in the mining and resource exploration industry. He's been involved with $2 billion of M&A. He was also one of the people behind the 2016 Integra Gold Rush Challenge and the 2017 Disrupt Mining Initiatives that encouraged innovation and technology disruption in the mining industry. Yeah, so it's a really interesting conversation. I was really happy to talk to him. I've never talked to him before. A lot of jewels in here to think about. A lot of original ideas, and there's nothing more I like in a thinker than originality. So with that, I hope you enjoy the interview, and I'll see you on the other side. Joining me today on the podcast, I'm very pleased to welcome President and CEO of Integra Resources, George Salamis. And uh, George, welcome to our Christmas holiday edition of the Northern Miner podcast. 
Adrian, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you as well. And uh, it's great to have you on. You have this reputation for innovation in the mining industry. And I guess you're involved with the Integra Gold Rush Challenge in 2016 and Disrupt Mining. Uh, I guess just a, maybe just a big picture question first. How, how are you feeling about innovation in the mining industry? It traditionally has a reputation for being slow to adopt new technology and innovation. How do you see things right now? Yeah, so I, I mean, just kind of taking a big step back, I you know I got I got into this um, angle of mine push trying to push for mining and innovation for the exact same reasons as you mentioned, Adrian, which is you know, the mining industry was just ahead of uh, farming and agriculture in terms of the the digitization of of the industry, as it were. I mean, so in other words, we were we were you know far behind a bunch of other uh, industries. And uh, it came out of frustration. I, I've got to say, you know, I was part when I started my career in the in the 90s. You know, I saw tech, certain technologies starting to get implemented, and and the, an immense amount of pushback from, you know, the previous generation of miners um, who operated mines and and were exploring at the time. And uh, that that always frustrated me. I was always trying to push for technology and innovation, and uh, there was a, an immense amount of pushback. So. I've, I saw myself as somewhat of a champion of, okay, no, no, this this needs to happen. And I was skeptical, I got to say, up until uh, the last couple of years when we started the disrupt mining movement and, and the gold rush challenge. Still at that time, I was facing what well, we were facing, the industry generally was facing a lot of pushback in terms of data sharing, um, some of the, the other uh, crowdsourcing, some of the other sort of techniques that were used in other industries. I have to say, in the last four or five years, I've seen immense strides made. Um, and I don't know whether that's just an older generation departing the mining industry and a younger generation coming in, but you know, I'm very hopeful now. It's funny you mentioned that. I, I agree, just from my perch uh, as more of just a watcher on this. But I've been to you know PDAC a few times, and I think I attended a couple of the uh, disrupt mining events. And it, to me, I think the reason it happened is I think it just became harder and harder for it not to happen, yes. maybe. Like it just became too obvious at a certain point. Maybe in yes. 2010, you could still kind of bury your head in the sand a little bit on these things. But in 2018, it just became too difficult to say, no, we don't need this, you know, innovation, you know, like, or. I I agree. I, I, I think you, you, you nailed it. I think it's, it's, uh, how should I say it? It was a we can't we can't keep saying no forever um, aspect in in the business. And again, I kind of re relate it back to um, age and generation. I think we've had a you know we've had an exodus out of the mining business of you know the last generation of perhaps those who might have pushed hard against technology and innovation. Those people who said this is the way we've been doing things forever, working at our mines. This is the way we've been exploring forever. You know. They're not all gone, but you know, I know a lot of them have departed from the industry, and so I think it was inevitable. Okay, and and finally on the innovation topic, are, are there any particular areas in technology or innovation uh, that you're excited about, or is it just a general sense that okay, we're sort of coming around as an industry, or is there something specific that you're really excited about? So innovation as it relates to ESG, I think. So ESG has become a very topical in the mining industry. And we're seeing we're seeing funds that are focusing sort of on companies that have uh, responsible ESG uh, platforms that they're that they're pushing. We're seeing it actually creep down into the junior mining sector. So we're preparing for it. But sort of specifically what I really excited about in the mining industry as it relates to ESG and technology and innovation is Things like mine remediation, things like um, you know restoring past mine sites to you know to a proper good sort of environmental status instead, if you will, and um, we're seeing a lot of that sort of new technology coming in into that sort of the the environmental aspects of remediation of, of mine sites. I'm really excited by that. I think I think that there's a perfect marriage there between good ESG practices and introducing some of these really sort of innovative technologies when it comes to treatment of mine residues, for example. There's a really good fit there. That's really interesting. In a sense, the technological innovation can help sort of uh, 
foster, we might say, the ESG initiatives and, and whatnot. So, George, you have a project in Idaho, uh, the Delamar Project. And so how have you found working in Idaho just from a general community regulatory ESG perspective? Uh, what's it like? We've been operating in Idaho now for just over three years, and we acquired a past producing mine site from, from Kinross that was restored uh, back to sort of its original state, uh, a lot of money spent on it. Kinross did a phenomenal job at, at uh, project restoration there. So essentially what we have now um, is a project where we're picking up from where Kinross left off from a mining perspective where they mine up until the year 2000. And just sort of first first off, you know, working in the state of Idaho has been great. The, uh, the state itself has a uh, really strong open door policy to to the junior miners specifically, you know, they take us on the road, they market with us um, in in various financial circles around the, the Canada and the US. You know, we've had the governor, for example, doing road shows with us uh, in the past. And and uh, so great reception from the state of Idaho. And then from a from a, an environmental perspective, Idahoans are, are proud. They're, they are focused on re responsible resource development for sure. There's no question about that, um, but they are, generally speaking, pro mining. This is a state that has a long history of gold and silver mining. In fact, this, the state was really founded on gold and silver mining back in the 1800s. So mining is really important to them, but you know, obviously responsible mining. And so our initiatives in Idaho to advance the project forward, and we've just announced that we're going into sort of pre-feasibility study mode here for the next year. We also announced that in parallel with the pre-feasibility study mode, we have a group that's basically going to step in and review all of the project development practices from an ESG and, and safe environmental practice perspective. And so if there's an environmentally friendly alternative to the way we would typically build a mine, they will opine an input into that study. And that was certainly uh, welcomed with open arms. Very interesting. So does that mean in other words that you basically hire a ESG consultant company for example, and then you get them basically to more or less audit what you're up to? That's correct, yes. Okay, so... It, it's almost, Adrian, it's almost like a, a shadow uh, study process, if you will. So, you know, we've got, we've got the regular assortment of engineering firms who will be driving the study forward who do this for a living. But in addition to that, we've got a separate firm who looks at what the engineering firms are doing and will opine and suggest, hey, you can tap into the power grid, for example, but maybe that there's another, an alternate power source that, that's greener, if you will, that's more sustainable, if you will, that, that can get put into the project plan. Those, those sorts of initiatives, are, they, they're really interesting and, and we've got a great reception to them. Now, do you think that's something that's unique to Integra in terms of taking that initiative and bringing on the ESG consultant in, in a sense ahead of time? Or do you think that's becoming kind of uh, the MO of the industry? I, I think it's becoming the MO, but we're only seeing that level of attention to ESG at, you know, amongst the big cap um, gold companies and, you know, resource uh, companies around the world. We're not, we haven't seen it yet sort of trickle down to our sort of advanced explorer junior developer sector, but it's it's coming and that's why we're doing what we're doing. A, it's responsible, it's the right thing to do, and B, it's what investors will demand in the future. So we're just kind of setting ourselves up for the wave to come, if you will. Interesting. Now, the project itself, it's a gold-silver project. How are you feeling about the project? How is it coming? And uh, are you feeling pretty good about it or how are things going there? Yeah, things are going really well, and uh, you know we've when we when we first acquired the project from Kinross, there was no no real sort of declared resource though. However, there was a sense that Kinross had left behind a lot of gold and silver resource in the ground, basically starting from surface. As I mentioned, we were were literally picking up from where they left off um, in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. So. We've got a very large resource. It's 4.4 million ounces of gold equivalent that we believe will make a very profitable mining operation. But specifically, what we always liked about this project was the optionality. There's a there's a, a modest size mining operation to be built, something that looks like 125,000 ounces 
of uh, gold equivalent production per year. And there's also a very large scale uh, project that we believe can be built there, obviously subject to further studies in PFS to come. But it's it's either a project that we build that we can afford to finance and build ourselves, or it's maybe it's a bigger scale project that somebody else can build. We we like that optionality. So do things like low oil prices, does that help you right now? Or is that are we too early in the game for that to make a, a real difference? Uh, it'll make a difference once we're in development and production mode for sure. Yeah, no question. And and is there do you have a rough idea of when you think that might be? Well, we've got so we've got another almost year's work uh, worth of study work to be done uh, until we deliver the the pre feasibility study, and then uh, thereafter we're looking at two to three years of permitting to get the project into production. Gotcha. Now, weird sort of technical question from a financial point of view, and then we can move on to the next subject. Is it possible that you can just say, "Hey, oil prices are low now, and let's say you think they're going to go up in two years." Can you just buy a whole bunch of options and kind of lock in your your forty five dollar oil right now, or is that possible? I know the producers do that. Um, that you know they'll they'll lock in low prices, low low price long term contracts on on consumables for sure. It's it's a little bit too early for us to to start considering that in terms of okay. future project development. But um, as we get closer, obviously, if if the oil prices hang where they are, you know, maybe we do it. But you know, maybe Adrian, in the end of the day, we might not actually go for a you know hydrocarbon burning um, haulage fleet uh, to mine gold and silver ores. Maybe we go for you know something that looks like a more electric solution to to conveying you know ore and waste around that the development and production site. Who knows? Yeah, are you seeing more of that happening? Say with projects of your kind, uh, is that something you're seeing just from your vantage point as CEO of a mining company? Yeah, so it's specifically in the in the realm of underground mining. So we're seeing the introduction of of you know electric haulage trucks, you know, conveying or bringing ores from underground to surface. Oh yeah, we're seeing definite uh, introduction of of EV technology into mining fleets, and that's a good thing. Right, and are you, I guess we're returning to the innovation topic a little bit. Are you seeing uh, automation, and is that in your plans right now, or uh, is that what you mean by EV machines? Yeah, so rather rather than using again sort of hydrocarbon burning uh, trucks to convey um, ores from underground to surface, let's just say, which is the way it's been done literally for a very long time. Rather than using, you know, oil or petroleum-based uh, uh, conveyance means to surface, you know, we're seeing companies starting to use electric haulage trucks to haul ores up to surface, in, and and uh, that's that's just the way things should go, quite frankly. And we're seeing we're seeing that being introduced at a lot of mine sites around the world now. Yeah, it sounds like it's also safer as well. If you don't need, it's sort of like these. Uh... You know, moon missions. If you don't need to stick someone on the spaceship, maybe that's a little safer. For sure, yeah, no, and and a lot of these these electric haulage solutions, electric vehicle haulage solutions, are are you know being driven remotely by uh, by people from you know um, tens of kilometers away in some cases. It's a more common image I see all the time as I go on uh, mine websites and looking at images for the newspaper. Uh, the guy with like three or four computer screens and, uh, you know, and it looks like he's, you know, inside the processing facility or the headquarters running the mine from his computer. Absolutely. Okay. Well, now you've recently written an op-ed piece for the Vancouver province on resource sovereignty. Now, I'm familiar with resource nationalism, but tell me, what is resource sovereignty? And you're referring to Canada. Could you just explain a little bit the point you were making in the op-ed? Yeah, for sure. It's just so essentially what what the, the point I was trying to make in the op-ed was you know, Canada has all of the natural resources um, that are required to, to basically feed the demand and the needs um, of the entire planet. You know, we've got everything, all of the critical metals, uh, for example, that are required in, in the electrification of, 
of industries around the world, Canada has all of those metals. And Canada has this great reputation for being responsible miners. If Canada, you know, really wants to uh, secure its spot as the leaders in in mining, um, you know, why not have Canadians essentially um, responsibly take control of their own resources, Canadian companies essentially mine them responsibly because we we know that you know they're they're no better responsible miners than Canadian miners out there. And that's a that's a personal bias. And I, I, I might take flack from that for that statement. But and then why not why not be the 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 producers of all these metals that that uh, countries around the world will require to to become greener, um, you know, leading that sort of green technology uh, revolution by responsibly mining and producing all those metals that are required for greening uh, economies. And that's what I meant by resource sovereignty. So how is that different from what we're doing now? Like, do you feel like we're kind of maybe mining the wrong metals or uh, help me out with how is that different from what's going on now? It's different from what's going on now. We've got a bunch of, you know, things we've got taking place in Canada. We've got a number of foreign companies, for example, that are that are also responsibly mining, but they're, let's face it, they're, they are foreign companies. They're not domiciled here. And so, you know, why not, why not have Canada, why not have the governments lead the charge on, on promoting responsible mining of its own resources in its own backyard? I and, see what you're saying. So you're saying maybe Canadians should take more ownership of their own wealth in the ground, in other words, like in a sense, and then we can actually help direct those things towards, uh, you know, say greener, uh, cleaner uh, ends, is, uh, rather than say, uh, in a sense, offshoring these responsibilities to a foreign owner. Is that where you're going with this? That's that's exactly where I'm going. And, you know, if you add the the additional benefit of of really focusing on responsible mining in Canada uh, of of Canadian natural resources as a means of digging ourselves out of this sort of the, the post COVID-19 economically ruined uh, economy. I mean, r- resources can really lead the charge on that if if we choose to do it and, and put some effort into it. And that's going to require the backing of, of the, the governments, both federal and provincial. Yeah, I actually totally agree with you. Like, I think uh, we, you see it now, say since uh, March, we've seen the base metals really rally like nickel and copper. And you're starting to hear, you know, the guys at Goldman Sachs and everywhere, you're starting to hear this kind of growing chorus that we're in a commodities bull market, the beginning of one. And and you see this sort of stockpiling, at least rumors of stockpiling at the minimum of commodities in China. It seems like we're entering a bit of a new paradigm in terms of the commodity. It, almost, it, This does almost bleed into resource nationalism a little bit. And so I think the timing for doing doing something like you're describing is uh, is is on track. So you're mentioning timing. I I think you're you're absolutely correct. I mean the timing could not be better. And and uh, just to kind of speak to the the rally in those those two uh, metals that you mentioned, nickel nickel and copper, for example. And you know Canada has has got. A lot of uh, both of those metals; those are critical metals in in uh, electrification. Electric vehicles, for example, require a lot of copper and and nickel. And so, why not have Canada uh, use its expertise? And you know, we've got this terrific mining expertise which we export around the world. Why not just keep that here and and focus it on on responsibly mining these metals that are going to be required to green economies around the world and do that in our own backyard as opposed to, you know, other parts of the planet. Uh, yeah, I just think it's such an excellent idea. Please no, continue. No, no, no. It's our it's our competitive edge. Right. And and so I'll even take it one step further. I don't understand from a political perspective, we've got nothing to lose on the narrative of uh, responsible mining in Canada as opposed to irresponsible mining in different parts of the world uh, because that's that's a great narrative and it's a responsible narrative. So why don't understand why why the the political parties on on all ends of the spectrum don't seize that and say, okay, we're going to we are going to develop our own natural resources in our own backyard. We're going to do it responsibly. We're going to become the marketplace for 
the delivering of raw and finished products to to the international markets and you know we that's our competitive edge and what better way to dig ourselves out of a covid-19 economic spiral um, as we come out of covid-19 uh, into next year it, it really plays to our strengths and the whole you know as we see globalization kind of take a step back a little bit at least temporarily it seems like the perfect pivot uh, to actually just do something like that. And, you know, the Canadian economy, you know, we have this real estate thing that's been going forever. It reminds me of Australia. And it just seems like that would be such a smart thing to do. We have policymakers that do listen to this podcast, I think. So hopefully they're listening. I hope um, they are. I, I do, Adrian. So tell me, you've also written on a, another great titled piece, The Art of Junior Mining m and and you're telling me before the podcast, you sort of see a potential wave of M&A happening. Uh, tell me about that and, and what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, yes. And we, we, in fact, we do see that wave coming in. And, you know, the mining business, specifically the gold, uh, the gold mining business is tends to be very cyc- cyclical five to seven years. And so there's a, there's a repetitive behavior of, of this cycle, which, which shows in this particular part of the cycle, when you know gold remains high and companies are making a lot of profits, you know you'll start to see gold mining companies, for example, and they've already we've seen it in the last few quarters, and I think we'll see it in into next year as well. Gold producers specifically uh, reporting rec- record revenues and record profits, and that's because their mine pl- they're they're delivering gold and silver, precious metals, into the market. At a in a price environment of eighteen to nineteen hundred dollar gold, where their where their mine plans are predicated on perhaps thirteen to fourteen hundred dollar gold, so they're making really great margins. And so we we typically see this when when there's a an increase in gold and silver prices that these companies will will you know they'll pay dividends to their shareholders because they they're sitting on a lot of cash. Um, they'll come a point, and we believe that that point is next year that. They may tire of of paying dividends and special dividends to their shareholders, and then they'll turn to you know what can we use our cash uh, treasuries to to acquire uh, for future growth, and that's typically when the M and A cycle really starts to kick off. We've seen evidence that that it's already has kicked off. There was there have been a, a couple of uh, really smart looking um, mergers and acquisitions completed in the last couple couple of weeks here, but. Um, we just think this is going to continue into next year. Interesting. And as as a company, are you guys uh, sort of looking at what's around you? And is, is that something in your purview or is that uh, kind of you're just focused on your project right now? Yeah, so we're, we're focused on the project. And as I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, Adrian, we're, you know, we've got one of those unique assets where it's not of a size from a capital uh, perspective to build that that's beyond our reach. It's something that we could finance today if we had to open that project ourselves. But it's also of a size uh, from a production perspective that might attract M&A attention in the not too distant future. So it's got that optionality. It's not like we're sitting here waving the, you know, take me over flag because this is an asset that's going to require a half billion dollars or more to build. It's going to require far less capital than that to build. So you know, we're just trucking forward. But we do believe that the M&A season for assets like this especially in, in safer jurisdictions like, you know, Canada and the U.S., for example, uh, will start to uh, gain a lot of attention moving into next year. Excellent. So as we wrap up here, uh, is there anything we missed? Is there any parting thoughts uh, or subjects that you think uh, that are on your mind as a global executive of sorts? And is there anything that's kind of on your mind that we haven't discussed here that you think we should discuss? In the last couple of weeks, I've been hearing a lot of sort of panic and concern. Is this gold rally uh, over? You know, is it is it overdone? Has it has it had its has it had its day? Uh, say relative to things like alternative cur- currencies like Bitcoin, for example. No, and, my, my favorite topic. <laughs> your favorite topic topic as well. Mine too. So you know, obviously, focusing on gold specifically, I don't think gold has you know anywhere near had its day. I think we're looking at, you know, for the next couple of years here, the holy trinity of circumstances, if you will, that will continue to propel gold. 
um, you know, low interest rates. I think all the central banks have unanimously said we're not touching interest rates for another few years here. We've got stimulus, uh, money printing, currency devaluation. That's always great for gold. And then the third piece, which we're starting to hear more and more of, is looming um, inflation. And uh, we're starting to hear, you know, this is inflationary talk amongst some of the some of the people who study these things. Um, you know, inflation typically occurs when you've got a lot of money chasing a smaller amount of goods. That's natural inflation there. So I think those three things uh, will keep gold at or above these levels where it's at now for for a, a good long time. There is absolutely nothing wrong with eighteen hundred dollar gold. By the way, we don't need twenty five hundred dollar gold. We don't need five thousand dollar gold. I know some. Some people are calling for that. This is a perfectly good gold price. There are companies are making are minting uh, yeah. these days at that gold price. So that's kind of what some of the things I'm thinking about. Don't panic. The sky's not falling when gold goes to eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. <laughs> um, so true. Everything yeah. will be fine. Yeah. Everything will be fine, and your oil prices are still low too. Uh, any thoughts uh, as we close on the? Uh, it, well, I guess just a couple of things. I was going to say on the Bitcoin versus gold debate, which is very topical. But you know, just on the inflation front, you know what I think is different because people have said, "Oh, the inflationistas come out," and they've been saying that for the last ten years, and really we're in a deflation. But I think what's different is I think it's becoming it's like the psychological phenomena of inflation. I think it's just so in your face now, all of the you know quote unquote money printing that's going on. And just the, the numbers that are being thrown around that I think there's just a general sense of, you know, fiat, you know, being just a little less appealing than it was five years ago, just being a little less sturdy that and we've seen the world kind of go in a very unpredictable direction. And all of a sudden, any, any, things seem a little more possible that something bad could happen. So I, I feel like there's a psychological element to inflation that wasn't necessarily there in 2010 when they were calling it quantitative easing and, you know, it was just a financial thing. Correct. Yeah. No, it, I, you know, there was, there was this sense of, um, you know, abundance, if you will, uh, that will drive inflation down. Um, and, you know, technology, for example, which will, will, will drive the cost of technology down to essentially zero, which will lead to no inflation, in fact, deflation. With what's going on right now, with the level of money printing, the mon the amount of stimulus that's been injected into the world economies, and I forget where we're at here, twenty trillion dollars plus, you know that money still hasn't had, uh, it hasn't landed, it hasn't had its effect yet, and and it will. So that's a lot of money being driven into world economies, and you know from a from a physical output perspective of all the goods that we produce, we're, we're not producing more than we were in the pre-COVID environment, maybe we're producing less. And because, you know, supply lines are moderately constrained in some cases. So that notion of a lot of money chasing a fewer fewer amount of goods is like the classic definition of inflation. Yeah, and as far as Bitcoin's concerned, like I, I sort of see gold and Bitcoin is actually a really nice pair in the sense that, uh, because gold is tangible and it kind of fulfills the one biggest problem with Bitcoin is it's kind of this intangible thing. Are, are you an owner of Bitcoin? I own a proxy for Bitcoin, which is a, a, a Bitcoin fund. Adrian, I, yes. I have this I have this this fear of setting up um, a Bitcoin account and then waking up one day and that app and that that, you know, gazillion hexadecimal code that I need to enter having sort of vaporized overnight and then what do I do next? So I own a proxy for Bitcoin and it's, yeah. it's actually quite well. Well, it sure has. Yeah, no, I got into Bitcoin only three or four months ago as listeners to this podcast know very well. You know, once you sort of get bitten by that bug, it's hard to sort of, it really, it's like a virus that enters your mind, you know? Yes. But, yes. Uh, well, George, thank you for the wonderful conversation. I'm off to go see the conjunction of the Saturn and Jupiter with my girlfriend here. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to you in the new year again. Sounds great, Adrian. It was great chatting with you. Merry Christmas to you too. And enjoy the conjunction. I'm going to try and take a look myself uh, tonight, though. I think we're getting, getting hit with some snow. Might be impossible to see, but uh, enjoy it and have a happy and safe holiday. A 
very enjoyable and interesting interview, a great novel way of approaching the Canadian economy. I, I couldn't think of a better pivot. Well, George said it best. Have a safe and happy holiday and Merry Christmas to all our listeners out there. Thank you once again for listening and supporting the program. If you want to help us out, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory or email and share with your friends. Until next week, take care. Take care.